Um, I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. My name is Paige Swafford. I'm a third year dual degree student here at Duke um, and one of the co-presidents of the MBA Energy Club. And I'm really excited to introduce our next panel. We have some wonderful speakers here with us. Immediately to my left is Zoe Gamble Haynes, who's the president of Pine Gate Renewables. We have Catherine Collins, the president of the Southeastern Wind Coalition, as well as Fred Robinson, the vice president of new market development at Cypress Creek Renewables. So renewable energy has come up a number of times today throughout our different segments. And um, it really touches so many different areas of the energy industry that we've been talking about. Uh, and with so much going on, we can't cover everything in 45 minutes, but we're going to try to hit on the big topics and trends that our panelists are seeing. And remember also that we'll do a Q&A segment at the end, so there's information on the screen about how to submit questions um, for our panelists. So to start us off, I want to give the panelists each a moment to introduce themselves. All three of these organizations are active, at least in part, in the Southeast. Um, so could you introduce yourself and your organization and share a little bit about why um, the Southeast is an attractive region for wind and solar development? So my name is Zoe Gamble Haynes, and Pine Gate is a utility scale solar company that has uh, it, its roots in Jacksonville, Florida, and then about 18 months ago moved from doing very focused on site origination to the, the later stages of development and project finance and owning and operating assets. We have projects that we uh, under development in 16 states. The southeast in particular, I think one of the interesting things about the southeast is that it almost um, is a market as a region because of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so you've had this incredible concentration of experience and talent that started looking around and saying, well, where else can we go? What else are we going to do? And other states looking to North Carolina and saying, how can we get some of that? And it's created a market. And I think it's a fantastic example of what, what one state can do to an entire region by just taking the first step. Great. Um, I'm Catherine Collins. I run the Southeastern Wind Coalition. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we work on wind power outreach and education around the Southeast. Um, so we cover 11 states in the Southeast. And uh, we look at land-based wind, offshore wind, wind imports, so that's generating in the Midwest and, um, and bringing that into the Southeast through transmission, and uh, supply chain. We, uh, the Southeast is a niche market for wind, um, but an important market at that. And what makes us really excited about wind at the coalition um, in the Southeast specifically is new technology. So the only way that wind can and will make sense from an economic standpoint in the Southeast uh, is through technology that helps us harness winds, harness kind of lower wind regime winds, higher hub heights, longer blades, so you can capture more energy with a single machine. Um, and we're starting, to see, uh, we're starting to see some excitement around uh, various developments in the Southeast, and we'll hopefully continue to see more. Sure, uh, my name is Fred Robinson. I'm Vice President of New Market Development for, for Cypress Creek. <clears throat> Basically, I mean, Cypress Creek's story is the Southeast. Um, we started out in the, in the state of, of North Carolina. We're a utility scale solar development company. Um, we were able to basically benefit from what I would constitute as one of the greatest solar markets I've ever seen. Um, so we, we, we have about seven to 800 megawatts of operating assets right now in the state of North Carolina and have started to kind of basically leverage that success story into other markets in the South. So we're just about to go into South Carolina. I think we just made an announcement that we're gonna do about one and a half billion dollars down there um, doing utility scale projects and have started to do some stuff in, in Georgia. And I think it, it really, it, the, 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 the crux of it has been really um, basing everything off of kind of the perfect elements that have come together in North Carolina. And it is the, the offtake regime they had there, the uh, fantastic labor market that was available, and just a lot of people who were willing to put their heads together and make this market work. Um, and we've started to basically expand it out uh, across the southeast. We're starting to do development in uh, Alabama and Georgia, have looked at some other states as well in the southeast, um, and have grown the company um, since that point. I think we're about 
26 states at this stage, so all throughout the country. Um, and I, and it, I will, we owe all of it, basically, uh, to the Southeast. Thank you. I think we're all really excited to dive in more to what you all have been working on. But Catherine, I wanted to start um, with a question for you. You mentioned that the Southeastern Wind Coalition focuses on onshore, offshore, and imported wind. And looking at the Southeast, some of the highest wind, wind speed potentials are, come from offshore wind. Can you talk a little bit about what you think has held, held back offshore wind development in the US, and particularly states like North and South Carolina, and do you think we'll see increased development offshore in the future? Yeah, so offshore wind is, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting technology, and it's a fun one. Um, obviously, people love to, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Well, a lot of people think it's beautiful, not everybody, <laughs> but um, you know, you get, you get scale, you get a great wind regime offshore. A lot of people talk about the, the offshore um, wind pattern matches load uh, much more closely than onshore winds. Um, so there are a lot of uh, a lot of benefits to offshore wind, but the the biggest um, the most important reason that that we haven't seen offshore wind development is uh, is cost. So the way that I see the offshore market um, kind of uh, moving forward in the southeast is right now in the northeast. Um, for those of you who kind of follow energy policy and, and state level policy, there has been a lot of momentum in the Northeast to heavily encourage offshore wind development. So just about all the states in the Northeast at this point have made a, um, have made a commitment to, uh, to source and generate a certain megawatt, a certain number of megawatts of offshore wind. Um, so I think that once we start to see that build out, we're gonna see a US supply chain start to take hold. Um, and start to see the economies of scale that we've seen in Europe that will uh, effectively bring those costs down to a point where you know I, I think you're gonna you're gonna see development move north to south. Um, so North Carolina's got an offshore lease right now with Avangrid. Um, they're really excited about that lease, but at the same time, they're the first ones to say this is a long-term play. Um, you know, you kind of you have to wait for the the cost curves to to you know supply and demand across and um, from a cost perspective and so. You know, we're probably looking at another decade out. Sure, that's great. So we all um, heard from Brad Kitchens in his opening address talk about the Renewable Energy 100 group of companies, and generally we're seeing growing interest from corporations who want to procure, procure renewable energy either on site or through virtual PPA agreements. So I wanted to ask you all, how have your organizations started responding to these new corporate customers entering the market how does this, or does this change your approach to originations and, and risk management? And Fred, if you'd like to start off. Sure, that. yeah, so I mean, absolutely. I, I think it's, a, it's probably the largest part of our, our growth strategy. Um, as far as like how we go about originating, like I kitchen sink it. Like if you, anyone in this crowd knows anyone who's looking for offtake, more than happy <laughs> to take that phone call. Um, <laughs> it, it, it honestly, it, there's, there's, there's so many ways that you can go about it. It depends. Some corporates like to go through brokers because they don't feel that they understand the energy markets enough. Mm -hmm. So you have folks like Altenex who think that they can come in and kind of help originate those sort of transactions. Um, you have your Fortune, five, your Fortune 100s who are probably some of the most sophisticated energy folks out there like Facebook, Google. They run their own process. So from our perspective, it's a lot of getting to know the people who are on their energy management team, developing a relationship with them, telling the story about who Cypress is, what do we do? You know, what is our operating history uh, and the performance behind our, our assets? But um, and then largely, you, you go look at the, the traditional power markets. Um, you know, your big trading desks like uh, Morgan Stanley, folks like that, um, Shell that has a big trade shop, and retail electric providers who are trying to make those markets. Um, but I, I think it's honestly, this is probably the most exciting for, for, for my uh, my role with the company. Um, it's probably the most exciting part of, of what we're working on right now. Great. Zoe, would you like to add to that? No? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Um, another key news headline we're seeing a lot of these days is discussion around the solar trade case that's going through right now. And we'd love to get um, your perspective. Maybe, Zoe, you can talk about how either your organization or the more broad solar industry is, is thinking about how they'll respond to these potential tariffs on, on imported panels, and, and what, in, what impact could that have on the uh, solar development that we're seeing? And just for context, does everybody in the room have know the, the story here? 
I don't want to repeat information that's already been discussed. One hand. Okay. We got one hand. One hand. Okay, good. Yeah, we're a little bit. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to give, I'll give a, brief, a, a very, very short synopsis. <clears throat> so the, the amazing thing about solar has been that we are driving costs down to the point that it is competitive, truly, with natural gas and other brown forms of power. And you saw things like the Georgia RFP come out where the bid prices into the Georgia RFP that were shortlisted were in the 20s, which is really phenomenally low. If you think about the cost declines for solar, when I started building, when we started building solar, I guess, I don't know, seven years ago, maybe longer than that. <laughs> Anyways, it was like, you know, $7 a watt. You know, and we were looking at bidding into that RFP, assuming build costs of in the 80 cent range a watt. And that has primarily come from two, for, from two places. The biggest, the biggest is the panels. And so there's been this incredible cost decline in the cost of panels. The other has been in the efficiency of, of building in all kinds of incremental ways. In large part, in my view, that has to do with building out utility scale solar in a concentrated and meaningful way in North Carolina. And that enabled this sort of uh, industry knowledge about ways that you can build a solar farm more efficiently. So that was an incredible promise. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> you don't have anybody trying to take the tax credits out of the tax reform. You don't have the you know, Trump administration coming in and saying, we want to kill solar. Instead, what ended up happening that put a huge wet blanket on all of this success story <laughs> is these two bankrupt companies that are manufacturers here in the United States that filed a trade case. And it's this um, sort of arcane area of trade laws called Section 201. And it doesn't require that the petitioners show any kind of uh, dumping or other government I intervention on this. All that the petitioner has to show is that there has been harm to US manufacturing. And if harm is found, there is a, uh, a recommendation for some form of relief in the form of a tariff or otherwise. And that decision is, goes directly to President Trump. And the, the president will ultimately make a decision on whether or not there, there should be tariffs put on imported solar panels. The petitioners asked for a basically a floor price. Panels were trading in the 30 cent range when this case came through. And they requested that there be a floor price on all panels imported from everywhere in the world of 73 cents, so more than twice the cost of what the current import cost was. And that had this incredible uh, immediate impact, both in terms of projects. So for example, Pine Gate was a pro had a project that it had shortlisted in the Georgia RFP. And we had to withdraw that project because it required a $1.5 million bid bond in order to proceed with the project, which is indicative and reflective of how mature the solar industry has become, that we're now this, we're not this sort of fringy kind of industry, we're now being asked to put up $1.5 million bid bonds in order to participate in real power markets. But we can't do that if there's the threat that panels are suddenly going to be more than twice the cost. So we had to let that project go. That was an immediate impact. Then the craziness started happening in the panel, in the panel markets themselves. So all of a sudden, supply and demand, everybody was trying to get their panels in country before the end of the year in order to escape any potential tariffs, while the rest of the market, you have to think about it, China did 45 gigawatts of solar last year. This is not a US, this is not just the United States isn't the only place in the world that is putting solar in the ground. So we're competing for panels internationally. And there was an, an increase in panel prices of approximately 30% that happened overnight. So companies like Cypress, companies like Pine Gate were building projects, had financed them, obligations under PPAs and our financing partners. And out of nowhere, you would have a panel manufacturer say, sorry, I know we said we'd deliver you panels for um, whatever price. We're not going to deliver you those panels unless you agree to pay 15 cents more. And so 
that was, you know, that was hard for a company like Pinegate, which was really in its first year of major construction on projects. We had 200 megawatts of projects that were under construction when this happened. So right now, the where it sits is that the Trade Commission took a bunch of evidence and made a recommendation that is equivalent to approximately 10 cents a watt. I gave three different scenarios for how that would work. That recommendation um, is now going to a, tr a US trade representative. So the president's office has assigned a trade representative to, to, make, to, to help make the recommendation about whether to accept what was proposed by the Trade Commission or whether to um, propose an alternative solution or no solution. We don't really know. The uncertainty is the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be a, a hearing on that in December. And then we'll have a, deci a decision by January 12th. OK. Thank you. I, I think everyone really appreciates that background for a, a very complex topic. And on a, a, a similar but, but different note, Catherine, you and I talked a little bit about how uh, the risk of that kind of trade case happening in the wind um, arena is less likely due to the domestic manufacturing that does occur. But we discussed potential, potential proposed changes to the production tax credit. So I hope you could share a little with the audience about what that proposal is and then about how your member organizations are, are thinking about it. Yeah, so um, it really just gets back to the whole uh, underlying theme of uncertainty. Uh, and so at the federal level right now, the, uh, the House tax reform bill has included in it, um, well, I'll, I'll step back a little bit, but the, the wind industry had negotiated a phase down of the production tax credit. The production tax credit is the main tax credit um, that wind farm developers uh, take advantage of and use. Um, and a couple years back, they said, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion uh, with Congress about, okay, we can't continue this thing in perpetuity. There had been a lot of fits and starts with the tax credits, um, as I'm sure most of you are aware. But uh, so there was a phase down. They said, okay, this year's 100%, next year 80, 60, for the next five years, we'll phase it out. Well, there was. Um, a 5% uh, safe harbor clause that was inserted in that, so um, in that original language. So if you either spend 5% of 5% uh, of the total wind farm costs in a given year, then um, and continue uh, continue development and construction from that point, then you're eligible for the amount of the tax credit in which you started and and made that initial outlay of 5%. So developers will do things like purchase certain parts of uh, the turbine in advance or um, make certain site uh, improvements that allow them to, to qualify under that 5% safe harbor law. Um, the house tax bill that was just proposed within the last week um, eliminates that uh, eliminates that five percent safe harbor, which might not sound like a big deal, but um, the American Wind Energy Association estimates that that will half uh, wind development over the next four years. Um, so it is it is nothing to be taken lightly. Um, you know they're they're hopeful right now that there's enough support in the Senate to ensure that um, that that isn't passed, but it could be uh, a huge hit for the wind industry. So I think. You know, again, it just continues to be uncertainty is is a big driver of um, of business risk and and risk in the renewables industry. Sure, absolutely. And I think the the topic of change and uncertainty is something we've heard a lot about today. Another topic that's been touched on a few times, um, particularly by Chip Russell during his Duke talk, was about energy storage. So we're seeing uh, growing interest in pairing energy storage with renewables development. So as the prices of battery storage systems continue to decline, I'd love to hear from all of you about um, what you're seeing in terms of developers exploring pairing storage with renewable development. Starting with Fred. Sure, yeah. Uh, so we, we actually just commercialized our, our first systems of solar plus storage. So we did. 12 systems in uh, Brunswick Electric Cooperative, which is right on the uh, eastern shore in North Carolina. Um, there are 500 kW systems with 500 kW batteries and two hours of storage, I believe. And the reason why we did it and the reason why the, the cooperative uh, wanted this system is basically we are storing the solar energy into the battery and then waiting to, for the, the, the cooperative to hit their, their peak demand. So in the winter, I think it's in the morning, and then in the summertime, it's in the afternoon. And it's a very 
they have a very predictable demand, and so we can come on, turn the batteries on, and what it actually look, acts like for the cooperative, it, it, it acts like a demand charge reduction. So from their view, it's, it's almost like it's a behind the meter system. They have a, a G&T, uh, which is a generation and transmission provider called NCEMC, and NCEMC actually charges them a fixed fee for the peak demand that they, uh, they, that they pull on um, from NCEMC. And so it's a 15-year deal we have, or 15-year agreement that we have with, with Brunswick. And, and what the batteries are, are basically just doing is they're coming on, reducing the, the peak demand. They pay a, a lower uh, demand charge to um, NCEMC and get some savings based on the, the, the way that the, the deal has been structured with them. It was the most difficult transaction I think I've ever been involved with. Um, I would highly not uh, advise it. if you can avoid trying to get the ITC on a battery, you should do it. Um, it was pretty, the, from a technical perspective, um, I don't know if a lot of people know, but when you take, uh, when you try to capture the ITC on a battery, there's a very rigid IRS standard that says that all the energy that goes into the battery needs to come from renewable energy. And so you have to do this very rigid accounting system to make sure all that is happening. Um, and it was, a, it was a very, very complicated process, but we did it, uh, and we spent a lot of money making sure the engineers got that right, so hopefully we're going to do some more. But I, I think if looking at the industry on a forward basis, I know that I, I heard someone on the panel before saying that in front of the meter storage was probably three to five years away. I, I actually disagree with that because the ITC is going to go away in 2019, and the, the ability of us to capture the ITC on the battery fundamentally changes the economics. And if you just look at how battery prices are, are falling, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, I, I think NextEra, some folks are here, they, they did a PPA for $45 the other day. I mean, you go back two or three years in the solar industry, and people would be jumping up and down for, for a PPA price like that. So um, it's, it's pretty incredible uh, to see how the economics have started to shift in such a short period of time. I mean, from our perspective on a planning, uh, when we develop solar projects, it takes us about, you know, uh, on the long side of it, three years, maybe 18 months to get a project done. So I'm already looking at 2019, 2020 when we're developing sites, and every site that we develop now is constantly, is how can we put a battery on this? How, how can we put a battery on this? The biggest gap I think we're seeing right now is there's very few applications right now. Demand charge reduction is a very simple application. The, the, the product that you're selling to the customer is pretty straightforward, and how we plan for it is pretty straightforward. I think where the, uh, the industry needs to start to evolve is to figure out application stacking or getting into more complicated structures of offtake. Great, thanks. And Zoe or Catherine, do you have anything to add from your perspectives on our customers, Zoe, starting to ask for batteries? Are, are your wind developers looking at this yet, or is it still a little farther off on the horizon? So I think that, I mean, I, I pointed to Fred because Cypress is really doing this in a way that, that I mean, I, my, the, that the idea of putting batteries with um, storage plus solar is going to be sort of standard, and it's not going to be that far away in the future. I'm hesitant because my my husband does battery storage development for the commercial <laughs> business at Duke Energy, and um, you know he I think he was recently quoted in Forbes saying that there, that batteries were going to blanket the nation, and uh, I you know I think there's some there are actually some truth when you look at the incredible cost declines that are happening in batteries. It's very similar to what happened in solar, and I think that. You sit here and you look at it as being a sort of future, futuristic technology, and very quickly we're going to look back on it, and it's going to seem just like what happened with solar. Yeah, and I'll just say from a wind perspective, um, in general, wind projects are on whole larger than solar projects, and I think um, you know the kind of batteries that we're looking at right now, where you're trying to to shave, um, you know, where you're trying to capture. Uh, solar energy, you know, during a certain part of the day, that kind of thing. Um, that makes a lot of sense to, to pair a smaller battery with a smaller system, 500 kilowatts. Um, you know, when you get to a 200 megawatt wind farm, 
your best options for demand shaving or um, you know, for, for really manipulating either load or generation uh, you know, kind of come from a utility scale application. So I think that's where you'll see um, larger utility scale batteries, but not that they would necessarily be tied to uh, wind development. Sure. That's great. So another discussion that we've had today on a panel earlier was around changing customer engagement. And that was primarily talking about the end user of electricity and their interaction with energy companies or with the utility. But I know you all also have to think about who are your uh, stakeholders and customers. So can you talk a little bit about when you go in to develop a project, how do you engage with the communities and really ensure the community is getting a benefit from the projects? Can you talk about some of the, the challenges you may face with landowners or local policymakers, and, and how do you educate them about the benefits of what you're doing? I feel like you're looking at me, so. Not... Anyone can All start, right. but you're welcome to. <laughs> um, so I would say that there's a, there's a lot of different ways that solar touches community. So the most fundamental is property taxes. So. You had to take a piece of land that was being used for agricultural purposes and was likely exempt in some way and not providing a lot of revenue to the community. And you're investing a lot of money um, that is providing significant property tax basis. One of my favorite flyers that I saw at some point in Darlington County, South Carolina, they were looking at property tax abatement. And, we're, and to be clear, like these, these dollar figures are with some form of property tax abatement is that the, the current revenue coming from this county was something like $800 a year. And if all of the solar farms that were proposed came through, it would be $1.2 million a year over the life of the asset. That's a lot of money for a community that has a population of, I don't know, I think it was 70,000 people. So it was the equivalent of, um, I think, 42 teachers, 13 new parks. Like really translate that into what is a, what what is available for a community when you're providing that kind of revenue without taking anything from it. There's no police services that are required, or roads, or water, or you know, there's th those are mostly just dollars going in. So that's the first thing that I always want to highlight for people when we're talking about these in the community. That's great. Thanks. Um, so maybe a little bit. Uh, a little bit different perspective, given that, one, I'm not a developer. Um, we, as a coalition, we very much highlight the economic development benefits of wind, and um, that's a great message for a lot of folks. Um, some, of the, some of the other resistance that we encounter is more um, at the local kind of county, uh, county commissioner level, and then sometimes at the state level, um, which we've seen in North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, in the last year or so. And so a lot of what our organization um, works on is engagement, not necessarily of the broader community always, but definitely engagement on those, uh, on those levels with those stakeholders where we feel like we can make a difference. Um, so bringing county commissioners in to, to try to um, you know, help them see, one, the economic, you know, the, the economic benefits usually are apparent for them, but, um, but what happens in a lot of places is you get a lot of uh, very smart misinformation campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people who um, are technically retired, but their full-time job is, uh, is going around and trying to um, ensure that no renewables projects, either wind or solar, depending on their preference, are developed. Uh, and so a lot of what we do is, is we go educate the county commissioners and we say, no, um, you know, the negative health effects cited are not something that you need to worry about and here's why. Um, people will not get nosebleeds and headaches and um, whatever else is, is sort of the, the fun of the day that, um, that these folks are bringing up. So a lot of what we're doing is, is really just trying to dispel uh, misinformation, which um, is very easy to find. I, I heard a couple times people talking about um, using the ice throw argument in North Carolina um, on, the, on the East Coast, so the, the large turbines, and if they collect ice, ice throw is when large turbines collect ice when it's uh, icy, snowy, rainy, um, and then it, it builds up and, and can fly off, but obviously not a, a, big, uh, a big issue here when uh, you know, you've got states like South Dakota, Iowa, North Dakota covered in wind turbines. Um, so things like that, we're, we're always uh, trying to find new ways to, to educate both our, our county and um, state level governments around the Southeast. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, over the past three years, we've learned to be way more proactive. I think one of the things that was probably a misstep on our part was we would go into markets, we would develop them, and then we would try to go to talk to folks. And I, I, it, it, you end up with a lot of misinformation or, or people are just kind of going by like a, a property and they see someone out there and you know, it, they start to draw their own conclusions. And so we're, we're way more proactive up front. Um, we try to meet with every single Farm Bureau uh, that we possibly can in any state to, to, to communicate with them what it is we're trying to do, what the process looks like, any economic development department um, that we possibly can get in touch with, um, it, getting involved in zoning processes if there's a, you know, a zoning rule going at the state. We'll try and get involved to help uh, guide that along by using examples we've used in, in North Carolina or other states. And I think the, another subset of that is we, we have tried to get um, uh, more in, uh, thoughtful on how we develop the solar projects. We, we started to do a pollinator program where we're, we just uh, commercialized a project in Maryland that, that has a pollinator uh, uh, little garden in the back that, that can kind of integrate better with the, the ecosystem around it. We, we, we put a, a bunch of beehives there, which I think our own and folks are really excited about. Um, but the idea is to really kind of get it more uh, ingrained with, with the community. And I think the biggest thing, too, is just always being really conscious of what the, what the solar system looks like. Some people really like it. We have a landowner who we basically surrounded his entire house in solar panels, and he's the happiest person on the planet. And other people don't want to see it, want to be anything close to it. And so to the extent we can get out in front of that and understand, you know, people in New York are going to look at solar different than people in Texas. And we just have to be conscious of that. Great, thank you. So we're gonna to turn to some of our audience questions and it looks like you all have submitted some wonderful questions, both new and following up on some of the things we've covered. So I wanna start off with um, a new question. One of our audience members wants to know, what are some innovative designs or technologies that you are keeping an eye on or looking to expand into? So one of the initiatives that I'm most excited about at Pinegate is we're calling it a permaculture initiative. So it's saying, okay, well, we've got this land. And beyond pollinators, which are an important, an important part of what I think solar is looking at, is how can we leave the soil in a better condition than how we found it? And so I say this is a technology is because it really is looking at our solar farms and saying, is there an asset underneath here that we haven't really been fully appreciating and valuing? So we have NREL using a couple of our sites to look at what are some co so there's Let me say the backup. There's two parts to the initiative. One is to look at how can we leave the soil in a better condition than how we found it. And the second is are there secondary agricultural uses other than sheep, which I know there's a lot of sheep that are put on solar farms, but we're looking at growing, growing uh, plants. What can be done on a solar farm in a way that is, you know, that, that, that can work together? Um, so we have our, our, NREL is doing some studies on our sites. One really cool idea that we had was from, the, from Oregon State. Apparently, there's only one kind of barley that is used in making beer. I don't drink beer, so I don't know. But <laughs> the Oregon State has come up with a new kind of barley that doesn't ever grow higher than three feet. So is there an opportunity to grow a different kind of barley and then maybe um, make beer that's solar beer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd get some interest from this room of <laughs> solar beer. But and I'm saying that is in terms of like outside of technology, yes, there's lots of technological advances, but for me the most exciting part is thinking more creatively about ways that you can maximize what's happening. Because as we use more and more agricultural land, the questions that come up in these communities will be, be more vocal. I'll just say, my guess is that because I do get this question um, a lot, especially in academic settings, uh, you know, talking about some of the, the new uh, Google technologies or Windlift or um, those kinds of things, they're very interesting. We don't do anything along those lines. Um, you know, we, again, we're not a developer, but at the same time, um, we definitely have a heavy focus on utility scale generation. Um, so in terms of utility scale generation, there are technology advances occurring all the time. They're just not that cool, right? They're not gonna make it to the, to the latest Costco magazine or whatever, you know, little free pamphlet that you're gonna get and read about something really cool. Um, 
clearly I read the Costco connection. <laughs> <laughs> I am showing my age. Um, yeah, so, uh, so you know, in terms, of, in terms of new technology, I mean, what, what we are seeing in the Southeast is new technology related to taller towers. So in Germany, um, one, of the, one of the tall tower technologies that they've used um, uh, in, in a pretty meaningful way is to do a concrete base and then put a steel tower on top of that. Because if you think about a steel tower and all you want to do is add 30 meters to it, um, it's not just an additional 30 meters. I mean, the instability that you cause and the additional, uh, the additional metal and um, material required to, to bring something 30 meters, uh, to add 30 meters in, in height is significant. And it's cost prohibitive right now. So there are a lot of new technologies for kind of figuring out how to, um, how to weld a tower in place uh, so that you can create a tall tower uh, that's, that's welded in place, sorry. Um, and uh, you know, gearbox efficiencies all of the time, longer blades, so all these um, fantastic new materials, lighter materials allow you to create a longer blade um, without you know, added stresses on the generator and the machine. So um, again, not the, the super cool, um, fun uh, technology advancements, but nonetheless, they are the advancements that has brought the cost of wind down 60% over the last five years. Yeah, I think the, for, for us it's probably a combination of hybrid inverters and higher wattage panels. Um, and basically, what, what I call them hybrid inverters. My engineer would probably throw rocks at me for saying that because there's like <laughs> 10 different varieties of them. But, but it's the ability to basically over, so in solar you have an AC side and you have a DC side. We always overside our, oversize our DC side so that we can have a longer life of the actual system so we can produce more energy because the panels degrade. Now that we have these higher wattage panels, we, we A, take up a smaller footprint, which is just good for, for everyone, for, for the local community. It allows us to do this, this, the size system we want to do, but we take up less acreage. But at the same time, um, it allows us to actually start to do more DC coupled battery systems. Um, and that means when we do the, the high AC to DC side, we get a lot of clipping. It basically means that we're basically like islanding power that we could use and, and deliver to the grid, but because our AC side is lower than our DC side, it's, it won't allow the energy to flow. We can store that in a battery um, and then use that, that energy later. I would say that, you know, from, from a technology standpoint, that's probably where our engineers are spending their most time right now. I don't know if that was anywhere near coherent, but that's what we're <laughs> focused on. That's great. Thank you. I think a lot of really cool ideas that you all are looking at. Um, we have another question um, going back to our conversation about the solar trade case. The question is, are you at all worried about a global economy where China controls the solar PV manufacturing? And do you see the trade case as being at all effective in helping the US to retain some claim in this manufacturing? It's an important question. Um, actually, I wish I had the slide. The majority of the panels aren't actually ma manufactured in China. Um, it's a, it is really a global supply, I think. The, so that's sort of a bit of a misnomer. A lot of that has already moved into other places. But I think it's a fair question to ask is should the United States have manufacturing for solar? Um, and I would emphasize that there is manufacturing in the United States for solar. There's 40,000 manufacturing jobs related to solar in making steel and the component parts and inverters and racking. and. Um, so just to make sure that it, we don't leave that part out because it's an important, that's an important story that needs to be sure, be sure we're, we're telling. Um, I think there is an opportunity for US-based manufacturing. However, I'm not sure that the solutions that have been really proposed by the commission in the trade case are ones that are going to provide the necessary certainty and long-term stability that are going to be required for the investments. So. It seems to me that the proposals that were, that were put forth were neither, um, I think you could have a smaller amount with money that was actually going towards investment in US manufacturing, or you could have a, um, you know, it's sort of, it was, it was sort of a, a decision that was like, what can we put in here that is not gonna hurt the industry too much? So we'll see how it ultimately shakes out, but I, I kind of think of it as like televisions, you know, we don't make, televisions here in the United States, but we have a whole industry around producing content that is very lucrative for our economy that wouldn't be here if not every home in the United States had a television. 
So I know that's not the same because you're talking about energy infrastructure and that's really important to our economy, but you're getting into kind of your view on trade generally. But Sure. I would just add, I mean, for the first point, is that Cineva is owned by a Hong Kong company, so all roads lead back to Rome. Um, the second <laughs> point is being is that Throughout this entire process, I think probably for, for me, and I'm sure Zoe feels the same frustration, is Suniva and Solar World actually haven't explained how they're going to be a profitable company. They're, I mean, they still have a, a tremendous amount of issues, even if these tariffs were in line to show that they could actually sell a product that is of high quality and would meet those price points. So, I, I mean, I think they still have a long road to go. There, and and to, to Zoe's point again is, there are people manufacturing panels here. The, the one thing that I think does get glossed over is a highly automated process. I mean, it's the same as where cars are going with Tesla. It is 100% a lot of automation. And so I think that piece gets not covered as well. And, and you, people should kind of appreciate the process of, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm all for getting domestic manufacturing here. But you know, it, the, the way that manufacturing is going, it is a lot of artificial intelligence. Um, and it would, in, even in China, they, they use a lot of very automated stuff. Um, and it's, it, the panels to me have become a commodity. I mean, they really have. It's, the technology nowadays is, is not overly that sophisticated. I tell people all the time, it's sand, some copper, and, and you know, some, some aluminum wrapped around it. Um, so it's, at this point, it really comes down to you know, who, from our perspective at least, is, is selling a high quality product, and then what is the price point of that, so. Great, thank you both. So the next question we have from the audience is specifically for Catherine. So they want to know what policies are in place in the Northeast for offshore wind that could be adopted in the Southeast. Uh, the policies that we've seen um, arise in the Northeast are, there's actually a number of different policies. Uh, everything from, so I'll start New York. Um, I'm not going to get all of these exactly correct because I follow them fairly loosely, but um, you know, New York with their 50% uh, renewable goal they effectively can't get to 50% um, without the use of offshore wind. So this is another thing that I didn't mention before um, in terms of offshore that I'll, I'll insert really quickly. The southeast has land mass that you just don't have in the northeast. We have much lower power prices than you do in the northeast. There are a lot of factors um, that would incentivize those state governments to say, you know what, offshore is going to be a really important resource for us. The other thing that it gives them is supply chain, um, manufacturing, kind of this, this global business that doesn't currently exist in the US, so they're very cognizant of bringing those jobs in, but again, it makes sense for the Northeast when you look at land availability and power prices. Um, so there are other states that have, they call them an OREC, so it's a specific, um, if, a, if a state has a renewable portfolio standard like North Carolina, North Carolina has a hog waste set aside. So there are states that have offshore wind set asides. When you talk about bringing that to the southeast, um, I think that, one, the politics are very different in the southeast. The southeast, in general, states don't appreciate mandates. Um, you'll hear the there's a, a relatively um, famous in the utility world commissioner from uh, Georgia who loves to tell everybody how Georgia's got all kinds of solar with no mandates, right? It's all supply and demand. Um, and so I, I think that we're fairly unlikely to see those same kinds of policy mechanisms enacted in the southeast. Um, but uh, like I said earlier, I am encouraged by the, uh, you know, I I'll call it a fact, but by the fact that, that prices, by the, by the Northeast kind of subsidizing this initial round of offshore wind, I do think that prices will come down precipitously to the point where the Southeast can say, yes, this is an industry that we want to host, this is an industry that we want to encourage, and that we will see offshore development um, in the Southeast. It will just be a longer time frame. Um, so hopefully that answer might not be the answer you love, but um, I mean, all you have to do is, is look at policies in general in the Northeast. The Northeast is part of Reggie. They've got um, tons of renewable portfolio standards uh, kind of across the board, um, all kinds of state incentives for solar um, and, and other technology. So it's just a very different market. Thanks. So we probably have time for about two more questions. So another question we have from the audience is, how will the U.S. leaving the Paris Climate Agreement affect future demand of renewable energy development in the United States? 
I think zero. I think every single, I mean, you've, you've already seen it. The, the, every, you know, you know, the city of Pittsburgh tweeting tr President Trump basically saying that they're, they're opting in. Um, you, most Fortune 500s, I think it's like 50% of Fortune 500s have a sustainability goal. Um, you've seen the Northeast has, has basically come back and really hard. You've got New York uh, and ISO New England in general. They're talking about doing a, a carbon program. So I think it's, you know, it, to the extent that the, the, the federal government is going to either scale back or, or stop, a, the, the, you know, uh, complying with the climate agreement, it seems like most of the states are, are going forward in lieu of that or corporates are, are signing on to R100. Great. Well, yeah, that's great to hear, especially for students who are looking to move into the industry shortly after graduation, that the, this won't be a declining space to be in. So um, another question that we have, which is potentially a fun one, what is the most exciting project that you've had a hand in um, in terms of renewable development? Too many to count. Yeah. Or are there some that you're looking forward to in the, in the, in the future? The next one. The next one. <laughs> oh, <it's> the next <laughs> one. That's wonderful. So we're um, really excited to have. I, I mean, <laughs> the reason that I stayed quiet, just <laughs> for the record, the reason that I stayed quiet is, you know, I'm not a developer, but um, you know, we're uh, as, as an organization and an industry, we're obviously extremely excited to see the Amazon Wind Project um, up in near Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Um, you know, take place that it was in development for over seven years before it even started construction. Um, and it's 208 megawatts, so it's, it's not a small project, it's a large project. There's an option for phase two, um, but there's currently a, a wind permitting moratorium in the state that's an 18 month um, permitting moratorium that was enacted uh, earlier this year. And so we have a lot of work to do to, uh, to ensure that that moratorium doesn't turn into additional wind legislation and hopefully can expire and we can continue development um, in this state. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's the first large utility scale project for the Southeast and more to come. I love all my children equally. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, we have just Thank enough time for, <laughs> for one last question. So. Um, given that this is a student-led conference, I would love for you all to share um, what advice do you have for students who are looking into going into the energy industry, the renewable industry specifically, what should we be learning about? Um, or if you're in the industry already, um, you know, what are the big trends you should be looking out for? Oh, pick me. <laughs> um, so here's my advice. Go to fake it school. And I mean this. You do not have to know everything when you walk in the door. Like, don't be afraid that you don't have the answer when you volunteer to give one. It's probably the biggest thing that I see for folks, the differentiator between those who succeed and those who do not are the ones who are willing to fake it. And I, and I say that because the other piece to that is to participate, to be a yes. My entire professional career came from the fact that I said yes to serving many moons ago on the, what is now the State League of Conservation Voters Board. And somebody asked me to do a fundraiser for the organization, and I said, sure, come on. Let's come, come meet me at my house, and we'll talk about how we're going to do a fundraiser. This guy drove to Winston-Salem, and we chatted about how I was going to do this fundraiser for the organization. And he asked me, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, this boring thing, low-income housing tax credits. You don't want anything about it. And he said, tax credits? Yeah, no, I want to know all about tax credits. <laughs> I've got this crazy startup solar company, and we don't know anything about how to get people to do stuff tax credits, and this was in 2007. And it was out of that conversation that I proceeded to write off 800 hours as a young attorney, figuring out how to make energy and financing structures work, and started a renewable energy practice at Blanco Tackaberry, which was the first law firm to really have a renewable energy practice in North Carolina. Represented a bunch of solar developers like Richard sitting in the back there when I was willing to work for $120 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, I, and I, really, I really point to that, and I can't say it enough, is like be a yes, participate, get engaged, because you have no idea what ways that's going to open up. Anyone else like to share? Great advice. Um, <clears throat> I would say um, I, my advice would just be show commitment. And I know they tell you this at Fuqua, um, showing commitment to the industry. But 
It's true. There, um, you know, there are a lot of people who want to be involved in the renewable space, especially. Uh, and so I think that you have to show both with your, um, you know, discussions, your networking, your resume, um, that you're truly committed to the industry. Right? This isn't just kind of the next best thing for you. Um, so showing commitment, how, however you do it. Right? You do things like help. Um, you know, you you host a panel um, at the uh, at the Duke Energy Conference. You volunteer for you know whatever. Get involved in the Energy Club. I mean, just anything you can do to show commitment uh, gives you a leg up. Yeah, I'm actually I'm gonna double down on, on Zoe's comment. I I couldn't agree with her more. I didn't. I might actually go a step further. And my our HR people always yell at me for saying this, and the fact that I'm gonna say it out loud now is probably gonna get them really upset. I like. I am a, just a very strong believer in like just pitching yourself to, to people and like whether it's, you know, if you have a company that you really like and they're, they're a startup and they're lean, they might not be able to pay you. Like the, the, uh, the ability of you to show that like, hey, I just want to work for you and it like doesn't matter if you can pay me five bucks an hour or if we can do some sort of, like especially at Fuqua, I did, I know Paul's around here somewhere, but I did a, a, some sort of independent study for him and we just came up with an idea. Like the, I think your ability to kind of come in and just keep a completely open mind, get in with a company and be like, hey, what, what, what sort of issues do you have? Like, let me kind of think through, you know, what sort of processes. We, we you know, we're based in Santa Monica, and from our perspective, we, we've started to get these UCLA MBAs coming in, and I, I mean, the, the people, two of them are working for us now, and they basically knocked on our door, wouldn't leave us alone, they're hanging outside in our parking <laughs> lot, and we're like, fine, you can go do that, like, do, look at these two things. Right? And now they're working for us. And I think that just, it shows, like, like you just said, it shows your level of commitment and it shows your passion for the industry. And when you have things like Suniva and potential tax implications, things like that, life can be a little bit chaotic on our side. Um, and so I think you kind of have to be a little bit annoying and say like, hey, I'm not leaving here until you give me something to do. Great, well, wonderful advice to end on. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today.